Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome, Father. It's good to have you here and on for another new show today. We uh, last week discussed the uh, Knights Templar and... Uh, did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> all, right. all of a sudden, it didn't sound right. <laughs> and uh, this week, we're going to go back and talk about John, John the twenty second. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, actually, uh, his his reign takes place after the suppression of the Knights Templar. So we actually are in um, in chronological order. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the things that happened during the time that he was pro- pope are just extremely important to us understanding the the flow of Catholic history ever since. And uh, he's one of those Avignon popes that once again is, I, I think, just um, uh, under understood. You know, I, I think that uh, we, we tend to just look over those that all of those Avignon popes very uh, quickly and mm-hmm. don't realize uh, the tremendous contribution. Realize uh, the tremendous contribution they made, uh, sometimes uh, to an excess. You know, in micromanaging the church, but then uh, you, as you're learning how to balance what what the right balance is, you often your the pendulum often swings in one direction or another, and so um, you know it's uh, he uh, he had two very interesting challenges, both of which we'll be looking at today, and and one of those was a very unfriendly emperor, and uh, uh, and the other was a. a a, a split, just a, a, a cracking in two of the Franciscan order at a time when the church really needed the Franciscans. Okay. So we can uh, take a little look at all of that. Sounds interesting. Do you want to jump in on this? Let's do, please. Okay. It, uh, I, I'd like to start with a very strange man. Okay. Um, he lived in southern France, and his name was Peter Waldo. Okay. And, and uh, Waldo heard voices. He was a, um, a merchant, a shopkeeper in Lyon in southern France, and he heard voices that gave him personal inspirations. And based upon those, he began preaching a, a primitive apostolic religion. Okay. So if you can imagine, right in the middle of Catholic France, hmm. and this guy is like out on his own. Not only that, but he's also condemning as evil um, much of the uh, much of the uh, the organizational church, okay. uh, the churchmen, and the and and the uh, the convents and the uh, monasteries, and, and certainly the the papacy in Avignon itself comes under uh, his his attack. Uh, he's arguing in favor of spiritual values of, of uh, poverty, uh, living in poverty, that salvation comes through poverty, and uh, and things of that nature. And, and his ideas actually spread. A lot of people are, are caught up with this. Well, we can see this all throughout the history of, of religions and certainly of Christianity, that there are these charismatic characters that mm-hmm. just uh, take you off in, in directions. And you look back and go, my goodness, how did I ever end up in Waco, Texas with David <laughs> Koresh? You know? Right. You know? Well, Waldo is something of, of, a, of a case like that, too. Okay. And so his um, his influence spreads throughout southern France and into northern Italy and the, the area of Lombardy. He has a very Manichaeistic worldview, and he, he, he touches that with a lot of others who do the same. In other words, that there's a duality in the universe, a good versus evil. There's a great battle that goes back and forth, and this... this uh, uh, this you 're part and parcel of this struggle, either you 're on the side of good or on the side of evil, and uh, you know you 're all part of this this cosmic battle okay. there 's some other names that are also involved in this at the same time, besides the Waldensians, you also have the Cathars and the Albigensians, mm-hmm. and these are weird groups also they are all opposed to the Catholic Church. These are people who left the Catholic Church and are opposed to the the Catholic Church. They are very, very strict in their in their lifestyle. Uh, as I was doing some work on this, I came across a uh, a little poem from um, uh, Hilar Belloc, mm-hmm. and 
as as he was uh, looking at, at at these guys himself. He says the following. It's a cute little poem. He says, "Wherever the Catholic sun doth rise, there's always laughter and good red wine. <laughs> at least I've always found it so." Benedictamus Domino. <laughs> <laughs> these guys don't have that kind of a sense at all. They're they're very very uh, strict. And in fact, as they looked at the world around them, they saw things that are naturally good as being evil. Things like oh. marriage. The Albigensians were against marriage. Not only that, they were against children. Uh, they believed that the uh, that uh, that a pregnancy itself is is the sign of the the um, the forces of darkness and evil. And in fact, it, at an age, we're talking the 1200s here, they advocated and, and mandated for their, their members who ended up pregnant abortions. Oh, my God. And that, of course, is extremely dangerous. Not, not that it's safe nowadays, but it's extremely dangerous then. And so they, they advocated that, arguing that matter is sinful, that all matter is sinful. And so something like marriage would be sinful, too. Wow. And that's something. The spirit is pure. The highest thing you could do is to commit suicide by self-starvation. And they actually had groups of people that would do that, supervised by the elders of this group. Now, you know, the Catholic Church is, is often beaten around the head for having been anti albigensian But when you look at what these people were standing for, now you'd have to understand that that it doesn't the take much to fight yeah, this definitely. or thought, to, thought behind fighting this. Yeah, they saw certainly the world as a, as a uh, us versus them, and, and certainly uh, <laughs> the popes uh, or mm-hmm. were them, not us. Um, you found within the the Albigensian communities themselves basically two levels of membership. Uh, one of them is called the the perfect, okay. and, the other, and the others are the believers. Okay. And the, and the perfect are really perfect. Okay. <laughs> and they live that perfection by self-denial. They're vegetarians. Uh, they live celibate lives, living in abject poverty. They're pacifists. They take no oaths of any kind. And this is a very small group within the community <laughs> as they attempt to make themselves even more perfect, which would ultimately lead them to the ultimate sacrifice which would be the denial of, of even food and water, mm-hmm. which is matter, of course, mm-hmm. which would then lead to their death, but as they would see it, their liberation to pure spirit. Mm-hmm. Pretty, pretty rough. <clears throat> the other group, which is in the majority, are those who are the believers, okay. <laughs> who aren't quite ready <laughs> to make that sacrifice yet. <laughs> and, um, and, and so you, know, you have... Uh, have this very strange kind of a, a group running around, and, and this is the sort of thing that uh, that the church is having to deal with um, yeah, throughout all of that. Honestly, they were very evangelical. They are very, very enthusiastic. You know, we we have examples of that again today. But uh, but uh, this was a group all throughout southern France, and then into northern Italy. Uh, this was a movement that was underway. The church used two religious orders uh, that predate the beginning of the, our course uh, to, to address the Albigensians. Okay. Okay. And they're going to be the Dominicans. Uh-huh. And the Dominicans are going to be used. St. Dominic is, is going to really rise up at this point. And, and he's going to create an order of preachers. Well, that's what they're called, the order mm-hmm. of preachers, who by their very preaching are going to win people back over. Uh, they're going to convince them of the error of this this kind of life. Mm-hmm. And then the other order that is uh, so essential in combating Albigensianism is um, it, are the Franciscans. Okay. And the reason there is that here you have a group of of people who are living poverty. Mm-hmm. In, in a very, very clear way, living poverty and at the same time not being weird. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, they've got, the extreme. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. exactly right, you know. And so those two uh, groups are, are very, very important. Unfortunately, the Franciscans had with them themselves some, some difficulties that were going to be manifested pretty soon. And, um, and one of these was the very fact of 
of, of their charism. Uh, within a generation of, of St. Francis, um, you had so many people who were involved with the Franciscan ideal you know, and, and, uh, and moving toward that, that it kind of overwhelmed uh, Italy. Oh, okay. There were too many Franciscans. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it, it's one thing to take uh, a few beggars mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and the, uh, the brothers and, and living in Umbria. You know, and, and everyone that's that's nice. You know, they're near home, and they get their handouts, and they they preach penance, and you know, they're warm, fuzzy friars, and you know that that's fine. But what happens when the beggars who were apostles and the apostles who were beggars attract so many others that there are literally thousands wow. of them? It becomes very difficult to live to support themselves. Yeah, keep and, order. Yeah, I mean, and if you could imagine such a thing as, as, as too many Franciscans in one spot at one time. <laughs> Hard to imagine now. But well, yeah. <laughs> but but the, and the Franciscan answer to that, this is within a generation of St. Francis himself, the, the answer is to, um, to begin to educate their own men, sending them away to universities to study so that they themselves would be able to become teachers and, mm-hmm. and uh, make contributions to the church and support themselves. Okay. You know, that seems to you know, make perfect sense. But the other side of it is that by doing that, it means also that you have to have houses of study. Mm-hmm. You have to have uh, some stability in your life and you have to have money. Mm-hmm. You've got to pay for the books, mm-hmm. you've got to pay for the school, the tuition, uh, you've got to uh, pay for the food. Uh, it, a, a university student, even a, a Franciscan brother, is not able to spend two-thirds of his day out begging you know, and, and doing the Franciscan thing and then at the same time studying. He's got mm-hmm. his homework to do. You know? mm-hmm. So what happens is that there are... to support him. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and, but there are compromises that have to be made okay. a, as a result, which, um, you know, as we're looking at it today, and as most Franciscans looked at it, and certainly most churchmen looked at it, in, um, in, in the 1300s and 1400s, that made perfect sense to, to go in that direction. But there was a group within the Franciscans that were uh, really adamant not to give up the extreme sense of poverty Mm -hmm. that Francis himself had lived and the early brothers had lived. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, tension that comes about, especially in the when the rule of the Franciscans is promulgated in 1223. There was a big question about how this was going to um, play out. And in the rule of 1223, the Franciscan rule announced a, a, a personal poverty. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Every mm-hmm. Franciscan would be personally poor, but that it would be possible to have corporate holdings. Okay. Okay. It's just like uh, most of our religious orders today that have a simple vow of poverty. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the brother or the uh, or the nun or the sister uh, or the priest who's living in that in that setting uh, doesn't own an automobile. But they have access to one mm-hmm. because they mm-hmm. need it for their particular ministry. Mm-hmm. Same thing would also also be true about a library of books. Uh, you know, go on and on, whatever. And and so this was the answer that the rule of 1223 had come up with. Within the Franciscans, there are a group of men who are adamantly against this, and they become known as the spiritualists. It, it's it's Saint Bonaventure who tries to bring the two groups together, oh, okay. who tries to show the spiritualists that the other side is just trying to answer the problems of reality. At the same time, using the spiritualists to keep the charism of mm-hmm. St. Francis alive. Mm-hmm. You know, Bonaventure, as great as he was, was, was unable mm. to keep the two groups from going at each other and ultimately reconciling. At the time of his death, there would be another falling out. Okay. You have to remember back uh, when we first started talking about this era that there was a pope, if you remember, Celestine V. Uh-huh. Remember? A very poor uh, hermit yes. who was brought in to become uh, uh, pope 
was pope for all, not even a year and then mm-hmm. retired no back to his hermitage. <laughs> you know? Well, what happened was that the spiritualists among the Franciscans had seen him as this God sent. Okay. Okay, that, that he, there would be a Celestine rule in which he, since he was a poor man, he would understand their position and therefore force all of the Franciscans back to this, this uh, primitive poverty. Well, he wasn't in long enough. Mm-hmm. And by the time they got their own rule written up, their own spiritualist rule written up, Boniface the Eighth was the Pope. Mm-hmm. And basically he told them, go pack it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, go back and, and rework and... Uh, and re- rework your, um, your rule, rule and mm-hmm. go back to the rule of 1223. Well, the spiritualists did not accept this at all. Okay. And so there was great tension in dioceses, even within parishes, in which you had these roving uh, friars mm-hmm. just roving around, uh, freebooting, and, uh, and doing their own thing and causing considerable havoc. And... Mm-hmm. Um, even Pope Clement V, the, the first of the Avignon popes, had called together at the Council of Vienne, which I had only said a couple words about, mainly from the Knights Templar point of view. Remember those mm-hmm. seven knights had showed up fully armored. But the council itself had been called to consider the possibility of a crusade. And it was also uh, to, to deal with the question of poverty, the question of poverty within uh, the Franciscan order. And in the end... There is no solution. It's around that time that the the superior, uh, the, the Grand Master of the Franciscans, uh, dies. Okay. And another one is not elected for two and a half years. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, along with that, uh, Pope Clement dies. And during that same period of time, two and a half years, there is no pope. Uh, you remember that, mm-hmm. that there's great difficulty in electing a new pope, uh, that the gangs from Gaston come over, beat up, kill some Italian, uh, Italians, including some of the cardinals. And, uh, and it wasn't for another two years that they were finally able to get together at a Dominican monastery in Lyon. Mm-hmm. There they elected finally a pope, and that, of course, is going to be the elderly uh, John the Twenty Second. So for uh, a couple period, a couple years there, there was no leadership even among the Franciscans, nor in Rome. It's uh, not Rome, but but uh, in in the papacy itself. Okay. And and so during that period of time, without any central authority, things began falling apart. The spirituals who were very very militant literally drove other Franciscans who disagreed with them out of the houses. Uh, these are known as the conventuals, okay. and the conventuals are driven out out of the houses, and chaos reigns. Okay. Mm-hmm. Finally, it, it's going to come after John the Twenty Second is elected. He himself is going to take action, and what he'll do is he'll put his foot down and excommunicate the spirituals. They they had to get back in line. This is all throughout. Um, especially in, in uh, Tuscany and Italy and, and in, um, in Sicily, uh, this, this is, is a problem. He backs the new um, master, um, minister general of the Franciscans, a man by the name of Michael of Cesena. He's a Franciscan who was elected the head of their order. And Michael needs a lot of help from, from the central authority of the church mm-hmm. in order to... Um, uh, in order to carry out a reunification of, of, the, of the Franciscans. And what happens ultimately is that on the threat of excommunication, all of the spirituals come back to the Franciscans. Everything is solved except for 25. There are only 25 mainly Italian um, spirituals who refuse to recant. Okay. And of this group, ultimately... Uh, four of them, the, 20, the 25 are arrested, and ultimately four of them uh, will not back down and are uh, tried as heretics and, um, and condemned. They're burned to death, hmm. uh, burned at the stake in what's known as constructive heresy. Now, constructive heresy, in other words, they don't say anything that's heretical in and of itself, but what they say is that the Pope has no authority oh, okay. over this uh, this area, over this jurisdiction. 
which is clearly wrong and therefore mm. is, is, is a constructive heresy. Okay. Well, what happens is that even in the, in the letters that John the 22nd sends in condemning their positions, there are uh, statements that are made that keep the Franciscans um, upset and concerned because even the Franciscans who are conventuals have a very strong sense of poverty. It's just that these guys are carrying it a bit too far. Okay. The conventuals aren't the spiritualists. It's the, no. the other way. It's the yeah. other way. Okay. The conventuals are the ones, are the ones who, are who are trying to find a way to live in the quote-unquote modern world. Okay. Okay. And with the charism of Francis without being you know, weird. Okay. I see. Okay. The spiritualists are the ones who are saying, no, we'll live in abject poverty and God will take care of us, even if there are a thousand of us in a town of 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. It's not very realistic. Right. Know? But anyway, that, so that's the, um, that's the breakdown in, in all of that. You know, in the midst of all of this, I want to take a, just a moment and step back. There is a movie uh, that deals with this particular era. And a couple of days ago, um, a lot of us priests were gathered together to, um, to, to be with a, um, a Vatican expert on inter-religious uh, relations, especially between Christianity, Catholicism, and Islam. And, um, and, and, and the priest, Father Thomas Michel, said that um, most, er uh, most Muslims in the world don't know a lot about Christianity or about Catholicism. And what they know, mainly they get through movies. And he mentioned um, Brother was it sister, sister, uh, Moon? Brother, yeah, sister Moon by St. Francis and there was a, there were some snickers there were about 90 priests and deacons in this assembly and so there were little snickers about that I don't know if you saw the movie I but still have not seen that I <laughs> hate to admit well but it's yeah. kind of it's kind of mushy but it's, it's a okay. cute little film but um, and then he said uh, either that or the name of the rose and there all throughout this, this assembly there was this oh no <laughs> because it is such a bad presentation of what actually was going on. If you're familiar with the book, which is a, a, a very engaging book and uh, a novel, and uh, the movie that follows with Sean Connery, um, it, it is a, it's an exciting murder mystery set in a medieval monastery. Okay. And it's set at the time of John the 22nd. But Umberto Eco, the author of this, who's a brilliant writer, has all the facts wrong uh. and, and just builds this, this story. Um, about this era, but it is it is just simply uh, not not factual. Mm -hmm. So, anyhow, uh, the long and short of it is that this is a real problem uh, that has to be dealt with. And and what what John the Twenty Second does is, and and he's he's he is such a villain in this movie and in this book. But in reality, what he does is he draws together the best theologians. He brings them to Avignon and he says, now let's go ahead and debate this. Let, let's see, in fact, whether or not um, which, which side is right. And so they begin this debating. And, and one side is arguing that Jesus and his apostles were, were poor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and therefore, the church itself should be poor. Should not the whole church should not own anything. Uh, and, and so the debate went went back and forth over these these questions. And there was a group of Franciscans who argued that it was a doctrine of the church that Jesus was poor, that he owned nothing, and that the apostles owned nothing, and therefore the church should own nothing. Now, we're not talking about evangelical poverty here. We're talking a very, very radical mm -hmm. uh, poverty. And uh, ultimately, what happens is that a group of, of Franciscans at a, um, at, a, at a Franciscan general chapter agree with that. It, it mm -hmm. takes place in Perugia. Mm -hmm. And um, John the 22nd response to this, both in, fifth, in, in 1322 and in 1323, pointing out some of the errors in, in the consulate at Perugia. First of all, he points out that poverty is not essential to perfection, mm -hmm. but charity is. Now, he turns as an authority to that, to, to back that up, to Thomas Aquinas, mm -hmm. who, of course, mm -hmm. has been dead for a number of years, but also is an Augustinian. I don't know if there's any inter-order rivalry over any of that, but it didn't win a lot of uh, <clears throat> arguments. 
The other thing that he argued um, is, is from a point of logic, and he argues like food. Here's an example. Food. You guys accept food when you beg. Okay. Now, if food is given to a friar, it is now his. It is his food. And so he owns it. Mm-hmm. And what he does with it is up to him. If he puts it in his mouth and eats it, he destroys the food. It becomes part of him. Right. Right. He has the right to destroy that food. And it's coupled, that right to destroy the food is coupled with the right of ownership, the authority of ownership. So, as a result of that, every Franciscan who eats, as opposed to the Albigensians who starve themselves to death, but every Franciscan who eats admits, at least by the way he lives, that he has ownership over the food that people freely give him, and he decides then on his own authority of ownership to destroy that food by taking it in and ingesting it. Okay. And therefore, John the Twenty Second comes to the conclusion. Therefore, the um, the Franciscans should live poverty in the same way that every other order does. They can love it all the more, but they have to live it the same way. Second thing he points out in his letters is that the Lord and the apostles, to, to argue that they owned nothing is in and of itself a, a heresy because they did have things. They might have given them away, but they did have things. Remember even, at, and he didn't use this analogy or this story, but if you remember even at the crucifixion, remember that the soldiers um, threw lots to see who would get Jesus' cloak. Mm -hmm. He had that cloak. He used that cloak. He had the authority of ownership over that cloak, which was only taken away from him at the time of his death. Well, the Franciscans themselves um, received these letters, these bulls, in in silence. And it was still a very touch-and-go kind of a thing. Um. At the same time, while this is happening, I, I mentioned that there was another problem that John had to deal with, uh, Pope John XXII had to deal with, and that was the emperor over in Germany. It turns out that the emperor is giving um, support and uh, an encouragement to the Franciscans, especially the spiritualists. Okay. Now, the reason for this is, let's go back for just a minute here. Inside the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire, an emperor is elected by a group of um, noblemen known as the electors. Okay. The emperor had died. The electors had gathered together for a new election, and they couldn't decide who the next emperor would be. There were two main rivals. One of those was Louis of Bavaria, and the other one was, I think it was Ferdinand of Austria. And the two of them went back and forth with each other. John the Twenty Second actually um, preferred a third man. He was the, um, he was the vicar of, of the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. His name was Robert of Anjou. He was living in Italy, and and because he had already had a lot of um, uh, administrative authority within the empire, John XXII believed that he would have made the best emperor and openly supported him. Mm-hmm. But actually, Robert of Anjou never had a chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, he never had an army. <laughs> and, and Louis of Bavaria did have an army, an army that defeated his Austrian foe. And so he became the emperor, or he just announced that he was the emperor and began acting like the emperor, even without the election Mm -hmm. and without the support of the pope. Mm -hmm. And so this Louis of Bavaria is is standing in contrast with John XXII. Uh, Ultimately, he moves John in such a way that, that John finally then goes ahead and excommunicates the Holy Roman Emperor, or the the guy on the throne, mm-hmm. whether he mm-hmm. actually is or right. not. Well, what, what Lewis then does is he tries to gather together religious leaders mm-hmm. who would do the same thing to John Twenty Second and claim that he is uh, a, uh, a, a, an anti-pope rather than, than the true pope. In the midst of all of this, John Twenty Second sends for the minister general of the Franciscan order, Michael of Cesena. Remember mm-hmm. the man that he had been giving help to. He brings him to Avignon 
And for four months, Michael of Cesena lived in Avignon, running the Franciscan Ardor from the center of the church, meeting almost daily with John the Twenty Second, in in trying to solve these problems. And other during those four months, they found themselves in disagreement over a number of things. And ultimately, on on the fateful day of April 9th of 1328, the two of them got into a terrible argument. And um, Michael stormed out and, and was arrested while still in Avignon. Okay. Okay. And, um, and then released and then snuck out. Okay. He went undercover. He snuck out of Avignon, made his way to Italy, and eventually made his way to um, uh, to Louis uh, to Ludwig, the uh, Louis uh, of Bavaria, oh. the excommunicated emperor. Okay. So now the excommunicated emperor now has the head of the Franciscans uh, smarting from a, a terrible argument that he had had with the Pope, mm-hmm. and now he's, he's staying with him. Not only that, but another very prominent um, philosopher, theologian, Franciscan, had also been at Avignon with Michael of Cesena, and he slips out too. This is William of Ockham, oh, the philosopher okay. William of Ockham. He also makes his way and to Perusia, where uh, the emperor is gathering together his his forces against uh, against uh, the uh, the pope. I, I have a question to go back real quick. Sure. How many? Do we have any idea what the percentages even of? Spiritualists, conventionalists, there were. No, I don't. I, okay. I really can't. I okay. can't give someone who might know that era or know the Franciscans might be able to give a better number of that. But nothing that I've come across has really given me a real sense of numbers. I I would guesstimate that the conventionals were in the majority, mm-hmm. and the spiritualists were uh, because of their uh, their adamantness. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, uh, would have would have had a greater influence beyond their numbers. And would it not have been possible for them to just split and <laughs> <laughs> doesn't that seem to make the most sense <laughs> yeah. I and granted you still can't have a thousand people living in a city a small yeah. city and, and surviving but yeah. but it, it just seems to me that it would have been made more sense for them to go yeah. off somewhere and live with live their idea I don't know anyway that's looking back. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And, and I think it also it's presuming some things, too, is sort of a 20th century uh, right. thing. Right. That's about, what I, yeah. It's easy know, to look back yeah, and, that's, and decipher that's right. things. These are, these are men, and, and we're basically dealing with the male Franciscans here. These are men um, who have committed themselves somewhere in their life, uh, have vowed themselves to the Franciscans, and now it's a question, really, of living out that vow as mm-hmm. they understand it and in purifying the Franciscan order as they understand it, uh, I would think that even if that were an option, the spiritualist would consider it to be a um, a failure to live out their vocation mm-hmm. if they mm-hmm. were to back off and let the conventuals get away with it. Well, actually, when you come down to only four, you know, yes. continue to hold those that position, then that does speak to them, holding yeah. the vow being more important. than the, Yeah, that's exactly right. There are only four out of the entire order. Mm-hmm. But now what we're seeing is because of political reasons mm-hmm. right. and because of personalities that now there are many, especially some leaders, some very important and, and influential leaders who are encouraged by an excommunicated emperor mm-hmm. to begin standing up to the Pope mm-hmm. and taking a, another position, okay. you know, a contrary position. And in that sense, um, that uh, the spiritualist position becomes much more important. In fact, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh-huh. Uh, some of the earlier spiritualists are, are revered as being great mystics. Uh-huh. And their names, which have pretty much 
uh, floated into the footnotes of history were um, uh, were everyday names at, at the time and and were uh, uh, invoked. Um, one in particular I'll, I'll mention is a is a Franciscan second generation Franciscan. Okay, right after Francis himself. Um, by the name of Joachim of Fiore. Okay. Now, you've probably never heard of this guy before, no. but he was an inspiration to the spiritualists. Mm -hmm. He died in 1202, so very early on, way before we even begin our, our, our own course. Okay. And he lived during the, um, during the generalate of a Franciscan who was accused of being very worldly. Uh, this is uh, a brother Elias, who he's one of the first to try to reconcile the world with mm -hmm. the Franciscan ideal. Mm -hmm. Well, Joachim of Fiore was was not at all um, uh, impressed with uh, with this. Um, what he and, and by now he's a very old man, and by the time brother Elias comes along, and um, and he's venerated because he goes back. He, he knew the first Franciscans. He, he has that spirit. But his preaching and his, his prophesying is, um, is, is quite different. And it's passed down now to the next generation, to the next generation, so that when you get down to Michael of Cesena and to William of Ockham and Ludwig of Bavaria, um, this is a venerable mystical tradition that is outside of of the of the church and and basically what he argues is this his vision is that that um that we are entered into the third age what he calls the age of the holy spirit okay and Joachim of fiore argues that that in the old testament it, it's the age of the father Okay, it's a, it's a Trinitarian concept, the age of the Father. And so all throughout the Old Testament, he sees that whenever you talk about God, it's basically the Father doing all of this. Uh, we certainly don't hold that today, mm -hmm. but that, mm -hmm. this is his own particular mystical tradition. And then he argues that at, at some point then, at the coming of Jesus Christ, at the Incarnation, it becomes the age of, of Christ, okay. the second person of the Trinity. So that everything happens now... Um, from the time of, of the Incarnation all the way through, when you talk about God, you're really talking about Jesus Christ. Now, this is almost a form of Marcionism, mm -hmm. you know, cutting off the Old and the New Testament mm -hmm. into bad God, good God kind of thing, you know. Uh, we've seen that before in church history, and, and Joachim is sort of doing this, but it's really when he gets into the next age that it really gets dangerous. He argues that that there comes a point in time in which Christ backs away from, I don't know, relationship with, with um, the church, with humanity, and the Holy Spirit steps forward. Okay. And when the Holy Spirit steps forward, it's the time of, uh, to put it as a Marxist, the withering away of the church. The institutional church withers away. And instead, the Holy Spirit then inspires each and every Christian individually into this age of Aquarius kind of okay. thing. Okay. When does that happen? Joachim of Fiore argues that it happens with the coming of Francis of Assisi. Francis would be appalled, <laughs> you know. But this is this is the, uh, the spirit that um, that he he. Uh, Argues, and he argues that that the sign that the other sign of the uh, of the coming of the age of the Holy Spirit is the decadence of the church itself. Mm -hmm. That the church would be so corrupted that it would collapse by its own force, and so all of the spiritually uh, engaged people would would then uh, just come to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Now you can imagine that that his prophecy and his writings is catching a lot of people, a lot of it's resonating with a lot of stuff. Peter Waldo and the Waldensians, the Albigensians, the Catharists, the spiritualists, you know, this is a, a an age of great foment, these you know these uh these fourteen hundreds of, of I'm sorry, the thirteen hundreds, great foment. And so um you, you've got you know some credence it, it seems to 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 some of this crazy but <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, not a, I guess now like you said it's easy to look back um, but uh, and I would think it would have been 
much more difficult. We have all the history and the knowledge the church has, has granted us. Yeah. It probably would have been easier to uh, acknowledge that as being an option. Yeah, and, and, and you know, honestly, we, we, we fall into this time after time. When you know, uh, you look back at, at the 1960s and the you know, and there are an awful lot of people saying this was the age of Aquarius yeah. and you know mm-hmm. all that. Um, it, it doesn't take much for us as a, a generation after generation gets fooled um, pretty yeah. pretty yeah, quickly. We definitely have our own thoughts. And you know, and, and honestly, we've got sects within Christianity that mm-hmm. that have announced the coming of the age. And uh, and they've been proven wrong time after time, and they they're mm-hmm. still there. I'm, I think of like uh, William Miller here in the United States, a simple farmer, who reads the Bible, is inspired, uh, thinks he's inspired, and then announces that the end of the world is going to come on such and such a date. And he gathers all of his believers, and a lot of them are, and they gather on top of a hill waiting for the seventh day advent mm-hmm. and it doesn't happen mm-hmm. so he comes down off the hill he looks through the bible and goes oh i made a mistake mm-hmm. uh, I, I miscalculations he comes up with the new date comes back up on top of the hill gathers everyone together and it didn't happen mm-hmm. so he comes down back to his farm and he starts looking through and he goes you know i can't tell <laughs> so he leaves his own church but there's a, there's another group that continues on, and you know it just continues on like that. So we still have um, groups that define themselves like marching to a different drummer, mm-hmm. and yeah. you can see why, why these people back at this time would be doing the same thing. What I find to be fascinating in all of this is that these um, th- these kind of spiraling off into into their own um, universes kind of movements that are taking place. Uh, what, what I refer to the seminarians I speak of as, as being the, the tangential uh, spirals. In other words, the energy that, that's taking the church and sending, that sending church people out mm-hmm. away from the center. Mm-hmm. So you've got the radial energy of the church bro- bringing everyone together toward its center, which is, of course, the Church of Rome. It's right. you know, the Pope. And, uh, and, and, but there's an opposite energy that's taking place, which is causing people to turn away from Rome and going out into another direction. And what I find to be fascinating in this period of time is that, that there are people who are taking this energy and they're beginning to formulate it into words rather than just actions, Albigensians or mm-hmm. Walden or, and then, you know, the, or the poor, uh, poor men of Lyon or th- those kinds of groups or the flagellants who go around beating themselves and all these kind of strange groups. Here are some people who are quite bright, but for their own particular reasons have turned away from the center, marched off in a different direction, and they're given, um, uh, they're given a podium to speak. And, and what I find fascinating is that it's in this period that you first have the articulation of an alternative ecclesiology, which ultimately is going to, we're going to hear this generation after generation after generation until finally some guy is going to take a hammer and knock on a door in Wittenberg, Germany, mm-hmm. and it's not going to be just an articulation. It's going to be a reality. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and so the whole Protestant Reformation can be seen really uh, in, its, in its earliest roots in some, mm-hmm. yeah, developing out of, out of some of these. So what happens is when the emperor sets up shop in Italy, particularly in the city of Pisa, and he draws in Michael of Cesena, okay, who is already broken with the Pope, and, and, and left, and he draws in William of Ockham, and William of Ockham more than anybody else. I mean, you can go ahead. Umberto Eco can can idealize this man and call him, you know, in the in the movies called William of Baskerville. He's kind of a you know cheap uh, Sherlock Holmes kind of a right. thing. And and you can idealize him and, and use Sean Connery and all this kind of stuff. But the fact of the matter is that this man did more than anybody else to destroy philosophically the medieval synthesis of Thomas Aquinas. Mm-hmm. You know, his whole uh, philosophy of nominalism uh, and, and people who followed that, just it, it just tears down the whole synthesis of Thomas Aquinas of using uh, faith and reason to bolster each other and and to bring uh, the light of truth, you know. And he's gathering there uh, also with um, 
uh, with, with Michael of Cesena. And then there's another man that's also introduced, a fellow that is not very well known. Uh, once again, he's sort of been relegated to the footnotes. But as I began reading the old historical masters, um, Ludwig von Pastor and, and others, the great histories of the popes, and I find these guys in footnotes time after time, they begin to come alive again. And this fellow, is his name is uh, Marcellus or, or Marcellinus of Padua. Okay. Okay, or Marcellio. He's, he's referred to in, in different ways. And he writes a tract that is called Defensor Pashis, the Defender of the Faith. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, Defender of, of, of Peace. And he dedicates it to the emperor. Okay. And, and here's what he posits. Here's what he's arguing. And we're going to hear this in different languages and different ways for the next 300 years. He's going to argue, first of all, that Christ did not establish the church. Okay. Now, in other words, that, that, um, that Peter was not given any keys. Mm -hmm. Okay. And instead... The church is a, a social organization. It's, it's an organization of believers. We gather together as, uh, as believers. The Pope's authority, which is real. I mean, you know, Michael of Cesena ran from it. Mm -hmm. William of Ockham ran from it. Uh, Ludwig of Bavaria is constantly struggling with it. It is real. But the Pope's authority, from his uh, point of view, does not come from Christ but rather from temporal authority. In other words, the Pope is invested with this authority because people have allowed him to subsume it. It is not divine. It's not of a spiritual order. And Who said that? The emperor is saying that? No, no, this no. is going to be a Marcellus, a Marcellus of, of Padua. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, of course, it's, it's music to the emperor's uh -huh. ears. <laughs> Certainly. And if, so if the authority, if, if God's authority... Christ's authority is not given to the Pope, you know, and, and, if, and if Christ didn't mean, you know, thou art Peter and upon this rock mm -hmm. I'll build my church, then where is that authority? Who has that authority? Well, Marcellus argues that that authority rests in the body politic. Oh. Okay. And well, that well. it kind of wells up out of the people and into their representatives, mm. into legislative bodies, into, in the church, consuls. So he's going to argue that it's the consul that has authoritative uh, decision-making, but, but not, not the, um, uh, the pope. And he'll also argue then that, that the authority of a consul is itself is dependent upon one thing. Scripture. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if you can prove it in Scripture, if, if, a, if a consul can argue from a scriptural point of view mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and find the truths within Scripture, then it can be accepted. Okay. okay? But how, how is the church dealing with this? How um, the people can't read, most people can't read. That's correct. How are they being instructed and helped to decipher this? Well, remember that uh, Defensor Pashis is written in Latin, mm -hmm. and uh, most people can't read, mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and they can't read Latin. And so this is circulated among a very small group of intellectuals. In fact, remember that there's no press. So, right. you can't, so what you have to do is you have to have scribes literally write out, I, mean, this, I forget how long this is, but let's, let's say it's 40 pages long. Okay. okay. If it were 40 pages long, you'd have to have scribes that would be writing this out on parchment, mm -hmm. on, on sheepskin, sheepskin <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. Very expensive, uh -huh. very slow process. And the only people that would be getting copies of this would be other intellectuals. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, this is a, a movement that is not popular. Mm -hmm. And, it, it's, uh, and, and these men would not see this as something that would be particularly... For them, it would not be important that the masses would believe this. Right. You know, they, because all they're working on, really, are the cultural, intellectual elite. Those are the only ones that they're really concerned for. The other side of this, John XXII, uh, as, as Pope of the entire church, 
is, uh, is, is interested in the continuation of the teaching of the Gospels. And that's done not, not necessarily through the written word, but in many cases, the vast majority of people learn their, uh, their, their, their Catholicism through going to church and, and looking at the artwork. Uh, teachers take them aside. I mean, I'm talking about the priests and and other religious taking them aside and saying this is th- this is the um, the Trinity. This is uh, you know this is the incarnation. This is what Jesus did to, did for us. Um, that's why things like like crutch scenes, um, once again a Franciscan idea, are so powerful and so important because it there are three dimensional ways in which we enter into the event right. and we can study that event we can meditate on that event and we can make that part and parcel of our own religious and, and spiritual experience you know what okay. I mean mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, once again uh, the sacraments mass those very simple signs mm-hmm. are, are going to be speaking very powerfully and that's how the masses of people are going to be taught certainly you have the universities also that are still teaching and um, and but there's a great battle that's going on in the philosophy and theology departments of Thomism versus nominalism, you know, and, and so there there'll be all of that happening too okay. at the same time. The um, uh, Marcellus, Marcellus again is, is is going back to his notion. You see how he's driving toward a consul. The consul is going to be the ultimate authority within the church, mm-hmm. and that authority has to be based upon Scripture. Uh, keep this in mind, too, that the only ones that really know Scripture are going to be the Scripture scholars. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a, there's a very interesting kind of, a, of an understanding of the magisterium that, that's developing uh, with, uh, with these guys also. Oh, you've got to have the Pope. But the Pope is basically, he has administrative authority that's, that's granted by the consuls and then also by the state. Uh, okay. this, you know, so there's that also. The property of the church is actually part of the, of the natural, uh, I'm sorry, the national treasury, the na- national wealth. And so, therefore, anything that is owned by the church is actually owned by the nation and can be taken back at any moment. A, a monastery where there's a group of monks that are uh, living out their lives and, and maybe they own, like the Cistercians had these great monasteries with all, all kinds of, of innovations, um, mm-hmm. tremendous herds of sheep and things like that. Well, that actually belonged to the state. If the state wanted it back, it could take it at any particular time. You name it, and and so everything is is really owned by the state. <clears throat> this um, th- this argument that goes back and 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 and, and forth then really um, is is set up. Now you have um, Marcellus of of Padua really mm-hmm. setting a, a tone toward. Um, this breakdown of of the of the unity uh, within the church, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yes. Yeah, and he's not that very well known, and yet and yet one of our uh, seminarians did a study this last semester showing that his work, Defensor Pace's, was in the library. He, we were able to find this out. Was, it was in the library at Oxford. At this, and Oxford didn't have many books, maybe okay. 20, 30 books at the time, but it was in the library at the very same time that John Wycliffe was a student there. Mm. Now, we don't know for a fact that, that Wycliffe even read this book, right. but we do know for a fact, and this particular seminarian did a paper showing that in many of the writings of John Wycliffe, there were sections that it looked as though they had been lifted from Marcellus of Padua. Wow. Now, if, the, if there is a link, then that link also extends from um, Wycliffe to Huss. And, and another thing that's very interesting, as we'll see later on, is the, uh, the sources that Martin Luther used when he was lecturing at the University of Wittenberg. Um, among the various books that he used was uh, books by William of Ockham Mm -hmm. and Marcellus of Padua, Mm -hmm. as well as a number of others we'll talk about a little bit down the line. So I would really say that if you're looking for a seed uh, for the Reformation, I would really look very seriously at this period in in the Avignon Papacy 
and and the dual challenge that John the Twenty Second had with a uh, a recalcitrant emperor, right? Who who aided and abetted the the uh, Franciscan spiritualists, who are represented a, a generation later by uh, these three individuals: Michael of Cesena, William of Ockham, and Marcellinus of Padua. Wow, that's something. What? What a powerful time it was. Yeah, that's for sure. Really, what developed? You know, what our our society has developed right there from that time. So much, yeah. So yeah. much of it had been, yeah. Very interesting, Father. Yeah. This is really, really getting good. <laughs> <laughs> Can you uh, close today with a prayer for us? Sure. Okay. We ask God to shower His blessings upon us as we as we gather and, and look to Him, recognizing Him as the source of all blessings. And we ask God to continue to bless our church in in every possible way. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is is now, now, and ever ever shall be, be, world world without without end. end. Amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.